Thank you, Jefe. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to come back to WCN after, I think it's been 13 years already that we've been part of this family. It really feels like coming back to family. And I thank you all for being here today and for listening to our stories. Um, so, oh, I'm, I'm also very glad that I'm going to be able to share the stage today with Johanna, who has been working with us for eight years already and is our deputy director, and she'll tell you other aspects of our conservation work. Well, um, a few weeks back, I had a very nice conversation with Alberto here in the picture. Um, Alberto is a farmer. He's got a 25-acre plot of land that he got back after the situation in Colombia changed after 50 years of war between the government and guerrilla groups. And he was one of the farmers that was displaced from his land and through, you know, hardship. And he recently was able to go back and be given a piece of land to work on. And the reason why Alberto was very happy is because last year he was able to harvest uh, oranges for the first time, uh, plantain, mangoes, cocoa, um, honey for uh, sale, and many other fruits and vegetables that he had never planted before. Because by tradition, Alberto was taught by his father and his grandfather that um, you rely on one or two crops a year, and for that, you need to clean the land and basically slash and burn everything that is in it and end up looking like this. And then, you know, plant one or two crops, usually ñame and yuca, which are roots that people eat very often in Colombia. And um, with that, that's basically, it was, it was great when it was harvested, they actually harvested. But then the rest of the year, especially through the dry season, it was really hardship. They didn't have anything to rely on and very little funds to invest in their land. So it was rough. And that's actually those practices, those agricultural practices that are so damaging to our forest is what reduced the forest in northern Colombia to 2% only. So 98% of the forest has basically been wiped down for either bad agricultural practices or for cattle ranching, which is extensive also in the northern region of Colombia. And that happens to be the home of the cutest little monkey in the world. Jefe? <laughs> I've 10, 10, 11, 10. <laughs> yeah, a one-pound monkey that um, has got very particular crazy Einstein hair and that it only lives in this very little corner of the world in Colombia where you see the red dot. You know, when you see the scale of our planet and you see this, this little red dot, it's amazing to think not even in the whole country, you know, you're seeing the uh, little map of Colombia at the bottom and only in that black area is where we find cotton top tamarinds in the wild. And that piece of land used to be, that area used to be beautiful forest, as you see in this image. It was basically a green blanket that covered the whole area and that has gotten, you know, basically tore down. And that's where our cute little monkey lives in the forest and even though it's a little monkey just a one pound what's really amazing is how much similar to humans it is we live they live in the forest like mom dad and kids so when the kids grow they go out and find a partner and make their own little home and the babies learn everything from their parents just as we do they learn what to eat uh, how to move around the forest they learn uh, what to eat and what not to eat. And they also learn how to stay safe from those other, you know, wildlife that eat monkeys, like, you know, boa snakes and raptor birds. Um, and what I've always been very impressed about this cute little monkey is the fact that he feeds from fruits, insects, and sap from trees, but he is a giver to the forest because of all the 40-some species that he eats with the fruits, when he poops, then he plants trees as he moves around the forest. And all those trees come out ready to germinate. And then you see little saplings when you're walking through the forest. 
and it's all because this little monkey is helping uh, keep, keep its forest very, very healthy. So basically, uh, cotton top tamarins take from the forest and they give to the forest as well. And this is a very important concept that we want to convey to people that we work with because it's okay to use what you have around you, but you also have to give to uh, the, the world around you. And cotton top tamarins, we have been studying cotton top tamarins for a long time. I think I mentioned before, it's been 30 years. This is actually a project that began as a research project from Dr. Ann Savage. She's from the US and she came to Colombia at a very young age to study the monkeys. But it has turned into, into a new approach at the moment because we know now that challenges are different than 30 years ago or maybe similar but a little more intense now. And we have been studying these monkeys uh, for many years and, and sometimes and we were chatting about the backpacks that are received, that's the antenna that receives the signal. We find the monkeys, sit down, study them by chunks of time, and record everything on, um, on the iPad, right? And this is actually, uh, the, the one in the picture is Felix. He was the first employee of Proyecto TT 30 years ago. He used to be a hunter, and now we call him the Tamarind Whisperer, because he can really understand and tell you soap operas of the things that happen in the forest, just like we do with our families, right? <laughs> and then there's Francie, who's one of our young biologists um, working in the field. And sometimes, you know, it's sitting down and just you know, looking for, you know, uh, observing what the monkeys do. Um, I would, I'm not sure if I should say comfortably look sitting down because we're talking about, you know, 90% humidity with 90% 90 degree temperature and lots of mosquitoes. So not that too comfortable, but probably more comfortable than having to climb hills to, you know, to follow the monkeys throughout the forest. And when it's raining, is, it means sliding down on your behind, <laughs> coming down from those, from those mountains. But this is, this is what you know, we do every day to understand how the monkeys live and what they need to make it in the long term. And unfortunately, because of forest loss, cotton top tamarins are critically endangered. That means that they're one step away from being extinct in the wild. They're actually quite popular in zoos because they were hunted or uh, exported from Colombia in the 60s and 70s for biomedical research. And then you might go to a zoo in Australia or New Zealand or Europe, in the US of course, to see, and you'll see the cotton top tamarins. But that's not the situation at home. We're down to about 7,000 animals, but only in 2% of the forest. <clears throat> And um, since deforestation or habitat loss is the main threat, then we decided a few years back that we would focus a lot of our efforts in rebuilding that forest. And we're very proud of the progress we have done over the last, uh, actually, uh, three, particularly the last three years, in working with the farmers like Alberto, I told you at the beginning, and uh, Manuel and Jose here, who are helping us uh, propagate these trees that cotton top tamarins feed from. So all of those trees that they use for their uh, daily diet and also the useful shelter at night, we are reproducing these trees and we're planting these trees in their land. And for that, we make an agreement. So the agreement is, say you have a 25-acre piece of land, you're going to set aside um, a 10% of it, and that's going to be connected to other farmers' land. And we're going to plant those trees that cotton top tamarins need for food and for shelter in those corridors. And then we're going to see these trees grow and we're going to monitor them. And in turn, we will provide seeds, training, equipment, and um, tools for the farmers to improve productivity in their land. So for one side, they don't have to slash and burn every year and suffer through a dry season. Uh, but also, they have more products, you know, coming into their, to their uh, farm every, every month, and they have a better, you know, income because they eat some of that produce, they, they grow in their land, and they also sell some of that. 
And here's a picture of Salvador who's planting a tree at the beginning of last year. And then recently we took a picture of, of, of how these trees are growing. And that's when, you know, 90% humidity and 90 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit help because everything grows really fast. And the amazing thing about um, now you see how uh, the, the land of Salvador has got a, like a brush in the bottom that retains water. And that water is becoming available to the farmers during the dry season because most of the corridors are designed and planned along the waterways that are part of their land. So besides connecting these isolated forests, we are also securing sources of water that people in Colombia need so much to go through the dry season and to have all of their crops grow and be able to have a permanent supply of food and an income for that. So it's working for them, and it's working for the monkeys too. And a couple of weeks ago, our colleagues that run, that help us uh, with the restoration uh, program shared this little video. <laughs> Quite a big jump for the monkey, right? But this is in one of our corridors. These corridors are a mix of little trees growing and other trees that were already in there, and they had not been seen getting so close to our nursery until we saw them a couple of weeks ago. And this is a big, big news for us because that means that they're starting to feel safe to come into these corridors and to use the forest that we're securing for them and also hopefully in the next few years use the, the uh, trees that we're planting for them. And I, you know, this, this map is it's a little complicated, but you will see there what are we trying to create. It's basically a spider web of corridors that surround that red area that you see is a national park. It's not that, that big, it's only 2,500 acres, I think, but it's one of the clusters of forests that are still left in northern Colombia. And all of the little properties that you see around are farmers like Alberto and Salvador who are working with us and they're getting benefits for the crops and they're saving some forests for the bunkies. So our next step in, the, in this process is the yellow properties that you see. We're creating um, connectivity to a new area and working with uh, 40 new farmers this year. And it's really amazing to see how uh, they begin to understand that they can take from the land, but it's good if you know, they can also give to the forest without having to slash and burn or to impact the, um, the, uh, the life of the monkeys. And uh, this is connectivity work. It's combined with our desire to own the whole northern Colombia for the monkeys, but not possible. But uh, we are very grateful to all of you who participated in our year-end campaign last year that allowed us to expand our forest reserve which is neighbor to this national park, to increase twice the size. It's about 200 acres more that are now safe for cotton-top tamarinds and counting because we cannot buy the old northern Colombia, but we're hoping to continue creating these corridors that allow cotton-tops to have more habitat and to jump around like we just saw a, from forest to forest in order to be able to, to have a secured living in the future. Unfortunately, deforestation is not the only threat that cotton-top tamarins face. Um, they are a cute little monkey, and people don't know that this is a species that only lives in northern Colombia. And because of that, they get hunted from the forest, usually having to kill you know, many of the family to just capture one, and they're sold in the pet trade as a way to generate an income. And now I'm going to turn it over to Johanna to tell you a little more about how we uh, approach the uh, issue of, of pet trade. And uh, Johanna, again, is our deputy director, and some people say she has the accent of Sofia Vergara, so you let me know if she does. <laughs> Thank you, Rosamira. Well, I'm from Colombia, but I don't know why they say that. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my, my work and, in Proyecto TT. This picture you, you see here remembers me eight years ago when I came for the first time 
to these communities. Um, I was excited and amazed. And I was, um, one of the things that amazed me the most was that people, the, ba the people's backyard is practically the forest. When kids wake up every morning, they can see the macaws flying by, or they can hear the howler monkeys. And if they go and play a bit deeper inside the forest, sometimes they also can see cottontop tamarinds. Imagine growing in this context. For these kids, it's very hard to tell the difference between domestic and wildlife animals. And more when they uh, are at the home after school and the father or the grandfather bring an animal from the forest after they um, are sowing or harvesting, they bring a gift from, from, the, from work, which are monkeys or birds or turtles. So when they grow and they have their own family, they find that selling resources from forest is a good way to put food on the table. Because as Rosamira told you, um, the harvesting is just one or twice a year, so in the meantime, they need to eat. We all do. We all need. So they sell resources from forest. I realize that we have lots of work to do not only by teaching kids about the environment and about conservation, but also helping their parents to find alternatives to live in harmony with nature. Eight years later, here we are. Many, many kids of these communities have participated in our education programs. This cute picture is about one of our programs because we have uh, education programs from elementary school to vocational school. These kids in elementary school learn about the difference between wildlife and domestic animals and why wildlife are not good pets. And they do this through puppet shows, coloring books, fun games, you know, for most of them, it's the first time in their life that have a coloring book brand new for them. So it's fun. And it's, it's also good to give them that opportunity to, to live these experiences. After Titi Kids, all seven graders in our community have the opportunity to go through Cortitia program. In this program, they know more about cottontop tamarinds, their forests, but also the threats and the actions, what they can do to help. When uh, we found that there is a group of kids that are really, really committed in uh, doing something else for conservation, and when we found that they really want to um, go and pursue uh, a career or, or actions to help, we create leadership programs for them. Um, this nice, cute picture is, um, is one of our um, visits to the forest. We go and visit the forest uh, in one of our programs, and for them it's the first time they can go and watch cotton tops on the forest from a scientific perspective. They go with our biologists, and it's not like they see the forest like a resource, but also not a resource to survive, but a resource to um, keep growing as a society. Then we, we capture all these enthusiastic and the leadership programs, and here they can dream high and create all these 
ideas about conservation and take them to their community. So they invite their neighbors and their uh, relatives to make conservation actions um, for cotton top tamarinds, the forest, and the rest of the community. This one is um, one of our newest education program. It calls Amiguau, which means something like friend woof. <laughs> the idea of Amiguau is make a bond between families and dogs. Because these communities see wildlife at, as good pets. But we say through this, hey, keep wildlife in the wild and take care of your domestic animals. Because for them, dogs are seen like um, a, a working animal to take them for hunting or um, take care of the property. But they don't see them like part of the family. See? So we want to grow that bond and, uh, and to make better that relationship. How we do this? Well, in Amiwa, we work with two kind of sessions. One of them is our grouple sessions where we gather and we discuss and make fun things to understand the concept of keeping well in the wild and taking care of the dogs. And then we go to the, their homes. So we have also individual sessions where, uh, where we work with the kids to train the kids to train the dog. So they learn um, that they can teach, in, teach tricks to the dogs, and that's fun. So they can have fun with, with the dogs. In this picture, you can see Brian and uh, his mom, Glenis. And they are actually reading a book, uh, it's a history, about a family that used to have cotton top as pets. But they went through lots of issues with this animal. And at the end of the story, they, they decide to change their minds and adopt a foster dog. So let me show you a little bit of one of our individual sessions. This is Brian and Lucy. As you see, both are super smart, super enthusiastic. You see that face? That's what I love about this video. That's the mom, you can hear? That's the mom. Mom, daddy and siblings are part of the sessions too. So we reach the entire family through these sessions. That face of Brian and Lucy worth everything. That is a face of pride. That is a face of power because they feel empowered that they can reach something. You know, in these poor communities, I learned that kids, kids they don't dream high because they, they have learned that it's, it's not worth it. Why I can I, I going to dream high if I can take my dreams and come them through? But through these this kind of um, programs, we can teach them pride for um, for nature and that what is out there matches with their values, but also that they have the power to change things and reach things in their lives. As Jesus told me once, I have never participated in a program that helps me to change things in my family. And he told me this because he's one of the kids who went through Cartitia program and leadership pro programs, and he created these initiatives to collect plastic in their community. And at the beginning, his mom and his grandmother resisted the idea. They, don't want, they didn't want to participate at the beginning. Uh, he, he, he worked very hard to convince them, to teach them, and now he said, I don't tell them any more, anything anymore. They already know. They already do stuff. How amazing is that? 
He feel empowered and he feel proud, proud of himself and proud of what he can do. As you can see, we are reaching their, par their parents, their, the, the adults, through kids. And we are changing their, their minds bit by bit. But there is still the need to put food on the, food on the table, right? Despite they are thinking different, they don't find alternatives in their communities. So the next step is create those alternatives so we can help them to live in harmony with nature. That's how we create several programs, and this is one of the more recent programs. This is a, the Recycling pl Plastic Program. What they do is that some members of the community collect the plastic bottles and they sell them to us. It's not a large amount of money they earn uh, every month, but sometimes, especially between harvest, is the only money they get. So what we do with the plastic we collect is to build these fence posts. We call titi posts because titi is the name in Spanish for cotton top tamarinds. So these fence posts uh, we are using to isolate the, the corridors uh, that we are we building with farmers, but also to isolate our research. This is another program led by women. Maybe lots of people here know or have an eco mochila. It's this amazing uh, bags made of plastic bags. They collect, they reuse, they reuse and then collect in, uh, in the from the community, and they design this beautiful art. Another program led by women is this plush toy program. They made this with the, their, their hands. It's all made by hand and by heart, too, because they put lots of love in, on it. And that face of this lady reminds me that we are not teaching about concepts or facts only. We are also motivate them, motivate the, the entire community to feel proud of the environment and that, that that is outside matches with their values and they can they have the power to change things in their life and in their community so if um, you really want to support this please come to our booth talk a little bit more with us I have plenty of stories and um, buy our products because that way you can help to these ladies. But not only, oh yeah. Remember they told that um, I'm talk like Sofia Bergara? Well, well, it's not only about me, it's not just me, it's, it's something about Caribbean people. We are loud. We talk hard and we love to party and dance and have fun. So why don't take all that, that pride and the, the, all that empowerment to a celebration, right? Because it's what we are. We create the Cotton Top Tamarind Day. And what we do here is to show to the rest of the community what we have learned during the, the, the year. Uh, and how we show this is dancing and uh, making um, uh, some theater. It's, it's um, everything around art and fun. But it's not just a matter of kids. <laughs> it's also a matter of adults. The parents are involved too in this celebration. And everybody. So um, I, I just want uh, to invite you to come. It's in August every year, the second or third week of August. If you someday are in Colombia by this time, you have to come and dance and have fun and learn more about what we do. Right, Rosamira? We love to have you there. So 
please come. And I'm going to turn it on to Rosamira because she's going to finish the presentation. Thank you. So yeah, we, we, we really considered doing that dance here, but maybe not, maybe, maybe next time, maybe in the booth. <laughs> no, but like Johanna just shared with you, um, we, we have just a very well-rounded approach. It's not only the monkeys, it's not only the research, it's not only the saving the habitat, but really, really uh, working with the people in many different ways. And that's why, you know, we both believe that the hope is in the people. It's in the communities, it's in the kids, it's in everybody who's touched by uh, the cute monkey and their beautiful forest. And just to close up, the other uh, convers that conversation I was having with Alberto, he was, he was very happy and he was saying, you know, this is very meaningful work for us. And he was so happy too because his grand he has three grandkids kids that have come, it's, uh, they're over, they're like on their, in the early 20s, and they have helped plant the trees in the corridor. So he says that that's also a family activity. And kids now are not that interested in farming because they were away from the forest for such, from the farms for a long time because of the violence. And now they have cell phones and TV and they don't want to come back to the farms. But this has been a great way to get them involved. And Alberto's really happy about that. But he's also happy because he said, it's been three years and you're still here. The communities are really tired of projects that come and go, but we're not going anywhere. So we want to be able to stay and be permanent partners and help more people and get lots of people involved. And in our future, it's growing too other communities and other states and be able to have presence everywhere where there's forest for the monkey and save the forest uh, for them and for us. And just keep in mind, all of us, that's what's good for the monkeys. It's also good for us humans. Thank you very much. <laughs>